Simmons. How's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. On this episode, I had a conversation with Luke Pell, and some of you may recognize his name uh, from reality TV fame. He was on the show The Bachelorette, um, the season with JoJo. I don't know uh, which season that would be, but I think it may be the last season or the season before. Um, Anyway, he and I sat down at his publishing company. He's a songwriter as well, and we had a lovely chat. We talked about all sorts of things. Um, it's funny, you see people on reality TV, and, and I suppose the whole point of it is to feel like you're looking into their lives. You have a snapshot into who they are, what they think, and all that stuff. But as most of us know, <clears throat> those shows are pretty scripted out in that people may be acting spontaneously, but once it gets in the hands of editors, anything is possible. And uh, I thought it was really important to dig down a little deeper below the surface of what he was famous for and just talk to him about who he is. And he's a lot of things. Um, He's a veteran. He served in Afghanistan. Um, He is a graduate of West Point. He uh, studied sociology and is very interested in that field. Um, He did all sorts of really interesting stuff, management-y type stuff, which I don't want to really spoiler alert away, but it's, it's, it's really fascinating hearing him talk about it, what he did. Um, he's involved in charities that are really great. And I mean, all around, he's a really interesting guy. Uh, so much more than I think any television show could, uh, ascertain, you know, even in an eight week period. Um, so yeah, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I, I'm really excited about the episodes that are coming up. Uh, There are going to be really, really some cool people on the show. And um, I'm I'm heading out on tour myself on on Thursday, um, which is the day this will come out, of course. And I'm not going to make my house sitter figure out how to launch all these episodes. So don't you worry. I'll have it all set up so that every Thursday morning, 7 a.m. Central, the new episode will be there. Um, So she doesn't have to worry about it or anything. Um, My house sitter, I mean. Um. Yeah, so the usual stuff, um, iTunes. Let's talk iTunes. If you get a chance, or could you carve out some time and go to iTunes, write a review, uh, put some stars up there on the, you know, rate this situation. It's under Hey Human on iTunes. It, it's, it's really super helpful. Um, it helps push the numbers up, gets the word out. The more that people rate and review Hey Human, uh, the more Amazon is, or not Amazon, where did that come from? <laughs> Erg. Uh, the more iTunes is willing to, uh, you know, talk or put it on the, hey, you should check this out list or whatever they do. Um, probably be good not to call iTunes Amazon. That might be the first step in having them like Hey Human and push it forward. Um, I'm also on Podbean, Stitcher, Blueberry. Um, I feel like there's one I'm forgetting. but uh, And it's on heyhumanpodcast.com, of course. And as always, there are links to every episode. You know, whatever we talk about, I try and pick out some, some really interesting factoids or things and, and link to that. Um, and Luke's episode is no different. Uh, especially when it came to his charities and stuff. I made sure to get that on there. And uh, uh, Oh, yeah. Social media. Facebook. Hey Human Podcast. Doc, or, sorry. Facebook. Hey Human Podcast. Instagram. Hey Human Podcast. Twitter, which I'm terrible at. Also, Hey Human Podcast. Um, and you can always email me, too. Susan at HeyHumanPodcast.com. I would love to hear from you. Um, please send me emails. And I think... I think that's all the housekeeping. Um, again, some cool stuff coming up. I've had some really fun episodes previous, so if you're into going deep, go for it. Go back some episodes and check out some of the older things. Um, really been a, a wide variety of humans on the show, and, and I'm digging it. Thanks again for listening. I appreciate it. Here we go. Hi, Luke. Hey, how, how are you? Doing? you? <laughs> it's good to be here. Thanks right. for having me on. You betcha. Of course, thanks for being here. Um, Luke Powell, you are a um, 
West Point graduate, is yeah, that correct? 2007. 2007. <laughs> um, you served in the Army mm-hmm. as a captain? Yeah, and that's, I got out as a captain. That was my final rank before I got um, off of active duty and came back into the civilian world. So. Okay, thank you for your service. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a great time in my life. Yeah, wow, really? Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. And um, you were on a show called The Bachelorette. Yes. Okay. And you, you you just told me off the off the microphone that you graduated from college in sociology and mm-hmm. my undergrad was in sociology uh, with a systems engineering minor. So. What is systems engineering? Um, it's like optimizing any type of uh, system. For, so like a very cliche one would be like an airport. Oh. Uh, how to make it um, optimally work on in terms of revenue in terms of um, throughput and, and flow and all that type of thing as well. So. What made you pick that? Um, I, I really wanted to pick it because it was preparing me um, to be a leader in the United States military. I knew that going into that, I would be in charge of soldiers that all had different backgrounds, mm-hmm. uh, that many of them would have different backgrounds than I would have, and I wanted to be able to relate to them and understand like why they you know, um, were going through whatever problems um, that they were going through and how to better lead them, I felt, if I understood them as people. Mm-hmm. So that was like my main idea. Did that. you know you were going to be in the military then when you were young? Uh, sort of the no, I didn't. What what happened was is um, I was recruited to play football at West Point, um, and West Point was not on my radar for college at all. You know, I'd grown up just a kid in Texas thinking that, you know, my other offers to play football were going to be like uh, Texas Christian University or University of Houston or some, you know, local within mm-hmm. a, you know, a few hundred miles of where I was from, and... And uh, that was kind of what I was expecting to do. Um, then the West Point uh, recruiting guys came, recruiting coaches came by, uh, and my high school football coach realized that I had a West Point resume as a high school kid, and I didn't really even know it. What and does so, that mean? You mean your grades were good? And your- uh, it just means that, you know, I made good grades. I was, like, captain of all my sports teams. Um, I did, like, Texas Boys State, which is a um, – it's a VA-funded – uh, like a politics camp that they really? choose to, you know, oh, every cool. every year they do it with kids that are, um, you know, as seniors in their high school or about, I guess, about to be seniors in their high school. And they kind of get them used to um, Texas or uh, state politics. And then, um, yeah, I was in like these leadership clubs, like 4-H organizations and things like that. And so I had all these things that I didn't really realize all the community service and stuff that I had done just growing up as a kid um, was what you know, they were looking for a, for a, for a West Point Did you have a pet resume. cow in so, 4-H? Pet cow? I never, I never showed cows in 4-H. Okay. Uh, I was actually into the horses. Oh, all right. It was like my 4-H, uh, They're easier know, to ride, I guess. Animal thing, yeah. That was that was more fun to me than, than the cows and the and the pigs and whatnot. So, anyway, yeah. So, then I ended up uh, going to West Point on that football scholarship. And then, so when I got there, then that's when I realized, obviously, that when I graduated, I would have a, a commitment to the Army after I graduated. So that's when I started trying to, you know, prepare and um, find some direction of, you know, what was the next 10 years of my life going to look like, you know, based off of that decision. So How does one wrap their head around the idea of, you know, not ever having that be on your radar and then suddenly all the things that that means? To yeah. Be in the I mean, that's, that's a huge undertaking. That's like taking on a completely different world, yeah. a totally different life. Yeah, it changed the trajectory of my life yeah. quite a bit, at least for that decade of my life. And, um, you know, I think that uh, there was so much I didn't know, um, but I just, it was you know, the, the learning curve was super steep, but I just, you know, took it one day at a time and started trying to, you know, just understand. And I, I grew up with these values of, you know, whatever you're going to be, be a good one, you know? And so mm-hmm. I just took that mentality into it and uh, just, you know, was, just wanted to achieve success in whatever I was doing. And so I just started doing that as a cadet at West Point and mm-hmm. tried to do it as a student, <laughs> which was uh, which was a tall order for me uh, coming from, a, you know, a small school in Texas and, and, then, and then going to this, you know, Ivy League level, uh, you know, educational demand and 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 so yeah, I don't ac- think academic people realize load. That, that that West Point academically, it's not yeah, it's not your average Joe. Yeah, they they really put a lot of kid, uh, you know, a lot of restraints and not restraints. They put a lot of expectations on kids uh, for their academic load. So they're taking like twenty one credit hours. They're looking know, for leaders. And then through their freshman and sophomore years, they've all got these very. 
um, stringent um, academic plans for what classes they, you know, prerequisite classes they have to take and mandatory mm-hmm. classes and all those things, which in, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going to be an English major or history major or something, at West Point you still have to go through all the math and science and engineering classes as well um, before you get to the, you know, the, uh, the more art based um majors so anyway uh that was just yeah that was those four years of my life were probably the most formative years of my life of you know you know taking me to what i am now and and where i even will be in the future it just it it did a lot and it was tough and um every day was a new challenge a new adventure but it was uh when i finished it it was just super rewarding you know i was like wow I made it. You yeah. know, that was all that mattered at that point is I made it. So is does everyone who attends West Point, um, do they is there an expectation that they are then in in the military? Uh I, yeah. I mean you have to, right? That's you Yeah, serve. so everyone that graduates from West Point then uh what it is is um you can go your first two years and then you can transfer if you don't like it or decide that um, for some reason that you need to transfer, you can go to another university, no questions asked. Mm-hmm. Um, when you come back, uh, the beginning, uh, semester of your junior year, then there's another swearing in ceremony. And that's when you get locked into the financial obligation. You can't leave at that point or you, you owe the military, uh, or the U S government, you know, all the, the tuition and fees. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even still, there's a lot of waivers and stuff you have to get. So once you go through that ceremony, you're locked in um, to be to say basically I will be um, commissioned as a, an officer in the U- U.S. Army after yeah. I graduate and do that for five years. So I've always been curious when when you go into the military. I know that GI stands for general issue, mm-hmm. right? That means that I mean you are at you serve for the pleasure of of your country, yeah. right? So that means whatever is required of you. Mm-hmm. Was that a hard? I mean, you're a kid. You yeah. know, you're going through and you. you, you like most 18, 19, 20 year olds, you have, you're developing your sense of self and right. your ethics and your morality, which given your upbringing, I right. suppose was already instilled in you to some degree, but yeah. you're still figuring out who you are to be somebody in the military means it, it's almost like a person who's going to go purchase a gun. For yeah. example, you, sure. you, if you're thinking clearly, you know, that if you purchase that weapon right that means you have to be willing to take someone's life there's no there's no middle right. ground i exactly. mean you have to be willing to go there in your mind and in your conscience right uh, so i'm curious like at that age how does one come to that understanding with oneself yeah it you know that's a great question i think that all those kids that come there um the vetting process uh for them to even get there is very strict mm-hmm. and and it's amazing that you know systemically that whole program of how detailed they are and how you know well they um select the kids that go there and then once they get there then there's a high you know attrition rate is pretty high Mm. um you know we started out with like 1350 kids i think in my freshman class and then you know you end up graduating with i mean i think after after the first year we were down to like 1100 Something you know, we lose a couple hundred, and then I think we end up graduating with like right at a thousand, maybe okay. nine hundred and something. So, attrition rates are pretty high um, because that's then you've got this long four year. That's what those four years are for for these kids to figure out for themselves. Hey, is this something? Once they learn and it's exposed to them, what reality of what their job and their career will be in the military? And, you know, can they handle the challenges of being a leader in the military and all those things? Is it good for them? Is it healthy for them? Can they handle it emotionally? Do they want to? Is it a goal of theirs at that point? And so, and then also, then you go through the, the tests that are built in uh, systemically to that program, and the program will continue to filter out kids over those next four years that they're there, of just saying, hey, they're not, you know, they're not competent in the skills that they need to have to go out and lead soldiers, you know, in in in, in combat, you know. So, um, I think that's why it's such a, it's really there's been years that um over the last two centuries really that um west point has been in existence that they've almost done away with it and been like hey we don't need a military academy really and uh thought that you know it wasn't right we can just do it through other commissioning sources uh to find officers and it's not great but i will say after going through it that 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 program it's it's really amazing and it really does require a lot of and it does define you know, and, and, and develops these kid and these kids into the cream of the crop of being a leader at a young age, understanding what it requires to do that successfully. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I think it's a I think it's a great program, and I was fortunate and blessed to be able to, 
you know, just fall into that opportunity and have that and uh, go through it. And, you know, I had no clue what I was getting into, you know, and then over time, you don't even, even when you're done with that, I did, I didn't have a clue what I just did. And then as, as the years go by, you know, now it's been um, 10 years since I've graduated from West Point. And so I look back and now I'm starting to see things that I was like, wow, okay, I understand more and more now this much time removed what I was learning and some of the, you know, the biggest lessons I was, you know, developing um, while I was there. So it's really interesting. What, what do you think was the biggest for you? I think, you know, the biggest are the ones that aren't on paper. They're, they're the lessons that you learn to just uh, learn to, you know, prioritize whatever you're doing. And, and make the best out of it and, and not take no for an answer um, is one of them, you know, and, and failure is not an option. You know, those are the type of lessons that you really take away from there that are the biggest ones. And, and um, they're not a badge, you know, they're not an award, you know, they're not on your transcript, but the biggest ones are just learning how to make, you know, decisions under pressure and how to, you know, lead, eventually, you know, you're leading soldiers in combat and that's what it all points back to is having somebody who can take care of soldiers. Cause some of these guys, they end up, you know, they're, they may be a platoon leader. Like I was in Afghanistan and they're leading 30 or 40 soldiers. But some of these guys that stay in for a career, you know, uh, 20 years, 25 years later, they become a general right. and they're, they're responsible for, you know, the success or failure of, you know, our, our military as a country, you know what I mean? So right. there's a, there's a lot of implications that come with that responsibility. Sorry, I'm so. going gonna, gonna to move this really quick. So okay. I can edit that from the moment. Sorry, I need to distract. But oh, okay. you're good. No worries. Every time we touch that thing, I'm worried it's going to go bonk, bonk. Oh, are we? T- oh, okay. No, it's all, it's all good. Well, okay, so that to me is super fascinating too. So you... you when you graduate, are you already a captain, or is that do you have to serve some time actively? Yeah. So, when you commission, you graduate and commission as an officer uh, after West Point or any academy, you're a second lieutenant, mm-hmm. or the equivalent thereof if you're in the Navy. But um, yeah, so then you're second lieutenant. You're and right now it's kind of time based. The way they have it set up is not. It's, it's interesting. I don't want to get too far into it, but how the ranks are in the military, um, it becomes merit based over the course of after you become really your third rank as a captain and go into being what they call a major in the military then it's like there's a, a zone there's people that start separating from their peers and they like they excel mm-hmm. and get promoted sooner but mm-hmm. everybody comes out as a second lieutenant they're about 18 months or so then they become a first lieutenant and then um and then 36 months in or plus or minus they become a captain mm-hmm. right now in the military so then they're a captain for a few years and then they go to the next one. So it must be interesting. so interesting yeah. to be even at the school because um, have you ever read the book Ender's Game by any chance? I have not read that. No. Okay, but. so um, it's set way in the future. It's science fiction. Uh, yeah. It's it's an incredibly good book. The movie not so great. <laughs> um, but you know it's this military academy in space. Right. Um, and one of the things that the teachers are looking for yeah. is psychologically. I. It's interesting because in order to be a good soldier, yeah. there are a lot of things one must you know absolutely you you have to be able to follow command but you also have to have a sense of leadership so that right right there that's a conundrum right right? you have to 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 find your spot and a follower right both Mm -hmm. in order to fit in but um and you also i imagine have to have a a a level of bravado and right willingness to jump into the fire exactly but then not so much ego where you're a horrible leader right and you just are a narcissistic you know egomaniac because that's dangerous so are there people that sort of are around constantly watching everyone's behaviors yeah and and thinking all right well this one's a little too (laughs) nuts and this one is a little too Um, strong you know yeah you know everybody while they're at the academy they go through blanket training Mm -hmm. where everybody kind of gets the same training curriculum not and, the same blanket. That's different. Right. Not the <laughs> different blankets. Same training. Yeah. Um, and then, as they go through higher levels of training after the academy, um, people start picking different career paths because people just a lot of times, if they're not in the military, they assume that the military are, is very similar and the career is very similar. But these guys, you go have completely different experience on one end of the spectrum than than the next guy, and they're both in the they're both in the army, maybe even both the same rank, but. They're in different units and have different purposes and what their unit does and things like that. So um, after you get out, then people end up wanting to make a career out of it. They'll say, 
decide to go to like special forces training mm-hmm. or what they call the Q course. It's where they select guys that can, um, you know, operate as a special forces operator. And so as those training different selection schools happen, that's when there's somebody that looks at them specifically under fire and says, can this person mm-hmm. um, be in this situation in real life in combat and can they handle it or not? And so they have a specific, you know, monitor uh, observation of how this person reacts. So, do they talk to you? Um, I know I'm asking a lot about military, no, uh, but yeah. it's fascinating to me. Um, do they talk to y'all about? Um, look, you're gonna maybe you might be in a situation where you know your friends are gonna die, or sure. you, you may have to kill someone, or mm-hmm. all. Do they have those conversations, or is that just something that's sort of known and then yeah. you just sort of move forward? Um, you know, they immediately go into those conversations oh, um, in basic training. Okay, um, they start teaching people. Um, the order in which, uh, you know, they'll say, okay, your, uh, platoon leaders died, has died. Your leaders died. Who's next? Mm. Who steps up? And so they, they start putting them in training situations in every training environment. Really. There are always people have to know who's the next person in line, because if you lose your main, your on the ground leader, who's the next one, who's the, who's the, the second, the third, the fourth, and that order all the way down to the lowest ranking person. And when can they take over and be in control? Because that's the... You know that's the the brave reality of the grave reality of war is that you know people die and leaders leadership um, gets changed out and, and somebody's got to pick up the torch and keep keep going. I think know? brave reality so. is also correct. Yeah, <laughs> brave reality and the grave reality. Yeah, exactly. Both so, <laughs> so um, how old were you when you uh, became captain? And did you become uh, captain already when you were in Afghanistan and they gave you captain status, or before you even went? Yeah, so I was in Afghanistan as a lieutenant. Okay. So I was a platoon leader there. That was what I my first assignment um, after um, graduating. I went to my officer training course in Oklahoma. And I went back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, and then um, immediately deployed with my unit to Afghanistan. And so I was a lieutenant there, and I came back. Um, I was here for about a year at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and then when I went to Fort Bliss, Texas, my final two years in the military is when I became a captain, mm. and then was a, a plans and uh, training officer out there. So, How old were you when you went to Afghanistan? I was 20, let's see, I guess I had just turned 23. Yeah, 23. I would have graduated when I was 22. Yeah. Two, yeah. Were you scared? Um, I, I think that for me, I'm sure there's, there's this element of fear and trying to, you know, adrenaline kind of reacts to that and responds to that fear. Um, it's kind of this, you know, murky thing between the two, which is which, and how do you, how are you going to be when, you know, combat happens? Um, I think that that was one thing that you do learn over those four years of going through all those training exercises is they build in habits and they build in, um, you know, countermeasures for to deal with emotion and fear and so they try to take the emotion out of your decision making because Mm -hmm. you know emotion is not really your friend in combat you need to react as as a tool and uh you know and and be always on and emotion just kind of clouds those decisions sometimes so um so yeah so you learn to and that's that was one of the things that was tough for me coming back uh and it is for a lot of guys um is is how to turn you know social emotion back on when you come back from a year of just being in this alpha male society where every day is business and and death is just part of you know life and death situations are just part of what you go through every day and so you, your emotion uh, level is very low in, mm-hmm. in in combat and so um, anyway so when you come back you're trying to like you know you're trying to reconnect with people and and have these relationships in your normal social circle and in, in, in your family that, um, you, you know, you're now kind of colder to those relationships and you kind of have to rebuild that when you get back. So, How did you do that? Um, I think for me it was just time. I didn't really, I didn't really understand the, how much difference, how much I had changed in that time. You know, it was kind of like this underlying thing that o- over the course of the next couple of years, I kind of, you know, when people would ask me like, Oh, did you have PTSD or what, you know, how do those things happen? And, and although I didn't have, you know, you know, PTSD in the terms of, you know, clinical PTSD or anything like that, or I needed treatment, it was like an outward issue in any way. But I looked back at it, started reflecting on it, opening up over the course of those next couple of years. I was like, wow, it's, 
I understand why now that it's a little bit more difficult to relate to, um, you know, kids or be just vulnerable and open to uh, my family or my mom or my sister or whatever when I had, you know, learned uh, to be, you know, just a little bit more cold and less emotional was the successful way to be in, in Afghanistan. But then you come back, you've got to like shed that. So Is that still, excuse me, something you're working on or do you feel like you've gotten you know, back to normal? I think, Whatever yeah. Normal is. Yeah. I mean, this many years later, you know, I feel like there's still elements of it. Uh, very small though, you know. Um, I guess when I'm in, in terms of stress, I, I kind of start, my reaction is to start just kind of shedding emotion and just going into like a decision making mode a little bit. But overall, I feel like I've really come, you know, leaps and bounds from where I was when I returned. And, and I understand it. That was That's always the first part of overcoming a problem or an issue that you have is understanding what it is, identifying it. And then you can kind of figure out how to respond to it and how to change it over time. So, yeah. yeah and, and that's part of, you know, the creative side of me, actually the segue of me moving back to Nashville um, and being a songwriter uh, was that was part of that for me one of the biggest benefits I get from being a songwriter is being able to put emotion into words mm -hmm. and into melodies and lyrics and to really be vulnerable with things that happen in my life and put it into a song and, and open that up whereas because that's a long way to come to be in that that, mil that non-emotional military world and then be able to go to the other end of the spectrum, which is to be a songwriter and be completely okay with emotion and and how to um, you know express that verbally and, mm -hmm. and those type of things. So um, was that a hard journey, or were you always creative before when you were young? And you know, I'm I don't know if you've I'm sure you probably have is read on being left-handed and right-brained mm -hmm. are typically are kind of inherently creative uh, creative people. And you're I in think, your right mind. Yeah, exactly. I'm in my right mind. I would like to think that it's probably get some hesitant uh, resistance from the, all the right-handed people, but um, <laughs> no, but I think that I do believe in that creative kind of um, instinct in me. I, I just always had that, you know, in music, even though I, I took a break from music, I was, uh, I took piano lessons for several years when I was very young um, and, and it connected with me, you know, very easily and it was great. And, um, then sports and different things, I got away from it like a lot of kids do in high school, and then picked it back up, picked up a guitar, and learned how to play guitar when I got to uh, West Point. Mm. And so, but anyway, it was always, and that was part of my thing, it was kind of therapy for me, even going through all that military time. I was still tied to my music, and I had, you know, the guitar was like my kind of escape back to, you know, just my center point, you know, of finding a, a, a spot where I could, you know, just find a release and, and be, you know, nostalgic and think about you know being home and the simple things in life that you know centered me emotionally so i always try to stay connected to that part of myself throughout my military time as much as possible and that's what music and my guitar being with me was you know you know i i imagine it must be such a, a strange thing you know you walk into a room and well i mean so really you have all these different hats you know yeah. you have the the guy that was in the military or well i guess you're always right. in the military yeah but, um then the songwriter guy and then the guy that's on tv and so does that how do you get to be luke the creative guy when you walk yeah. into a room when when all this other stuff sort of permeates your being yeah. whether or not you're giving that off i'm right. sure that people have an expectation whatever it is mm -hmm. negative or positive how sure. do you deal with that yeah i think there are a lot of you know you know, like i said earlier being a sociology major uh in college helped me to understand not only the people around me and my soldiers and and why people become who they are and is it nature versus nurture and all those things um but also helped me or started helping me understand myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think over the years and going through the military time and just a lot of self, um, you know, reflection, you know, I started understanding and becoming comfortable in my own skin and just mm -hmm. kind of being an open book and saying, look, we, you know, the human instinct is, is to you. So a lot of people, they get into these double lives type of things where 
they've got their their social their their outward life and then they've got some a lot of things that they hide and some people have more things that they hide than others and so i tried to get to a point in my life and just, it's a and i will always just try to always be at this point because i think it's a lifelong pursuit is to just be an open book and be who you are because in today's world i think 21st century with you know social media and all these things it's people well you know quote unquote keep up appearances you know and mm-hmm. i think that's so much what people's lives are just just based around and oriented around is keeping up appearances and and uh and so you know for me to be able to handle all those hats that i wear is that i just try to be the most authentic version of myself whatever that is and just be that in one-on-one relationships with people and then also be that with my relationship with an audience or whoever is Mm. seeing me from the outside looking in is like they have a pretty good idea um quickly who i am when Mm. when i walk into the room or when i meet them so um but that that takes a lot you know and and i actually another thing that i'll bring up is i worked for a company uh that was another great part of my development um after i got out of the military before i came back to nashville it was a great company great people great mission it's called the flipping group it was a it was a uh, consulting firm and so what they did was um they did executive coaching and leadership training for uh fortune 500 ceos and their their leadership teams all across the country and so i got to be in the business development self slide of what they did and um and and they would profile people similar to what you see as like uh myers briggs profiles Mm or you know the mbti or, or the disc profiles something similar to that where those profiles look at um, personalities and like do you have personality conflicts or not Um, what the flipping groups profile did was it looked at people's behaviors because behaviors are very different than personalities personalities are kind of inherent in what you know who you are and how how your what your nature was and how you were raised and how you were born whereas behaviors are actions and can be changed and they're how you perceive like so you know you're out your inner circle but people looking at you from the outside looking in they they see your behaviors and that's how they form an opinion of who you are as a person mm-hmm. or, uh, and who you are in that relationship and so uh, the flipping group would help leaders become self-aware was the big thing that people were always trying to we were always trying to help people understand as a leader is the first thing you need is to be self-aware how how do other people see you so once you understand how you're you know the six people that work with you the most frequently how and, and the most closely how do they see you and so do they see you as a high nurturer or a low nurturer? Do they see you as somebody who is high self-control and is, you know, hesitant to speak up in a meeting or in a group? Or do they see you as somebody who has low self-control and will reflexively just say whatever comes to their mind? Mm. Are you um, a highly motivated person who is just um, very proactive and just goal-oriented in life on a scale of 1 to 10? Or are you somebody that's just kind of like lackadaisical about life and life just happens to you? So we go through all these things. And we help leaders understand that about themselves and how their people see them. And then they can adjust. We help them take steps uh, to adjust how they react and how they behave and how they lead their other people. So that was that was really fascinating for me to go through that process, be in that company, and then understand myself even more. Um, Does that teach people to be, do you think, maybe this is just per, per you know, everybody's individual, yeah. their, their own thing, but... I would think that in a way that's good training to teach you either to be your authentic self or to manipulate those around you. And you know what I mean? Yeah. That there's a there's a deeper level of that. that right. Someone's teaching you, hey, people are perceiving you this way. Right. Yeah, you could you could choose. You could choose to try to um, deceive people. But I think that the cool thing is that, uh, especially if you stay within the confines of their system, that, that gets mm. found out. Yeah. Because what you'll do is they'll pull feedback from, say, a couple family members. They'll pull feedback from a couple peers, pull, pull feedback from your boss above you, pull feedback from people that work for you. So then <clears throat> if somebody's operating and behaving differently in different circles, then that shows up on the, uh, on the thing as well. So if I'm, and, and, but, you that's know, naturally it kind of does anyway. Like you're tr- at home. You're a little bit different usually than you are at work, and for good reason. Um, but all that shows up in those results, and then people can understand that. Because there's amazing how many people don't understand like their self awareness. They may be, they'll be the vice president of you know X Y Z corporation that's like a household name, and they don't have they don't realize like how cold they are to their employees, or how cold they are to their own wife or their family back home. And so 
we can go in there and profile that for them and show them the results and they have these light bulb moments again and again and they're like I, I didn't realize that they saw me as so cold and just uncaring about what you know they were going through or whatever again though there's so, that that leader quality that one you know yeah. if you were to give the Myers Briggs let's say to half the CAO, right. CEOs in America right let me guess that some of them are going to show up as sociopaths. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, probably... There's an absence of empathy that, that one might require right. in order to move up the ranks quickly or to be the be- very... Like a Steve Jobs, for example. Yeah, to be aggressive. Not the nicest guy to his family. Right. But a genius and right. clearly had his shit together. For, right. You know. So it's it's amazing and that's a whole other... There's so many conversations that go beyond yeah. that in that world. Um, but to see the results of people understanding themselves and how they behave as a leader how you know good bad or indifferent yeah, sure. for them to have that self-awareness so for me personally it was it was great because i could understand uh how people perceived me and then understand once you understand that then you kind of understand you go through these self-respect or self-reflective times where you're like who do i want to be like who do i what's the core of me mm-hmm. why do what's my purpose why do i get up every day why you know why do I want to have a headstone that has something meaningful on it and the people, you know, and leave a legacy behind when I'm not here anymore? Um, and so I think that that was just how I started becoming just motivated about life. Is just like, like what's what's my purpose today? Why am I why am I getting up? Why am I making any decision uh, today? What impact is it leaving on the world and the people around me? And mm-hmm. so then I started living that way, and just it, it opened up a lot of. It just opened my opened me up a lot. Opened up a lot of relationships, a lot of opportunities, and, and things started happening. And so, um, also, I mean, I feel like I have, I don't know, I had a little bit of career, I don't know, ADD in, in a sense where I was kind of like, I'll oh, try this, try that, you know, jack of all trades kind of thing. Um, but I think that I finally got to the point where I understood the core of who I was, and at least the space that I wanted to be in, you mm-hmm. know, and. Uh, and so it didn't as matter as much what what I did for a living in those short term moments. It just mattered about more about who I was, you know, not what I, not what I was doing, but who I was. And mm-hmm. so that that's that's you know how I I go about every day. And so anyway, that makes it easier for when I when I can wear those hats. Like we got back to at the beginning of this question was how how do I you know, wear different hats and, and, and go into a room and, and handle that and, and know that people are all seeing me from different angles and and uh, seeing me as, you know, have a different perceptions of me, so. And when you perform, there's a vulnerability that you, sure. you know, in order to have that communion with your audience. Yeah, you absolutely. Have, you have to be laid open. Absolutely. Truth with a capital T, you know. Right. And, uh, I mean, that must have been an interesting thing to go from what you where you had been and then redefine that part of yourself yeah it was and i I love transition in life because you know people get in comfort zones and they get complacent Mm. and 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 i hate to see that in people uh they'll live their whole life just like scared to get outside of their comfort bubble Mm -hmm. you know whatever it is maybe a career bubble it may be just a a relationship bubble you know they're in a they're in a toxic relationship or a toxic environment and they just can't there's just something need a spark to get to break those chains and get out of it and uh and so i always like and and welcome transition in life like just just that movement of being able to to go from one um one career or one you know, maybe it's geographic. Maybe you just pick up and move and, and transplant your life somewhere else. But that transition and be able to handle that and go through the challenges that come with that tran- life transition really, I think, help people understand who they are. It does for me. And so for me to go from being a military guy to try a couple of corporate, you know, management jobs, you know, being the, being an oil and gas company for a while, then go be a uh, you know, business development sales guy for a leadership development firm and then be like, you know what? I still, I want to be in Nashville. I want to be a creator. I want to be a songwriter. I want to connect with people. I want to be emotional. I want to be uh, completely open and vulnerable to who I am and the people around me. And so I, I pick up and I come to Nashville and say, I don't, you know, I haven't been in Nashville for 10 years. Like some of my peers, you know, being in the career and playing the politics of Nashville and, and doing all those things. But you know what? I'm going to start today 
and I'm going to learn to figure it out one day at a time how, how to do that, right. um, how to become that person. So um, that's, you know, that's kind of the stage I'm in right now. And so then a TV show comes up and I say, why not? I, I'll, You're talking about I'll, The Bachelorette. Yeah, I'll try a reality TV show and see how that affects my life and the people around me. And it's it's something different, something unique. And sure, that's exactly the type of thing that I would like to do in this phase of my life where I'm about to transition is that that will definitely stir the pot you know of, of my life so yeah so it's a good segue into yeah. the bachelorette so for a guy that's living his authentic self that is yeah. self-aware that is growing yeah i mean let's just take the bachelorette out of it for a second mm -hmm. reality tv out of it for a second and just yeah. being in the, the world at large i think most people are not real great at self-awareness yeah you know? and so absolutely. navigating dating mm -hmm. when you're when you have an understanding of growth and self-awareness mm -hmm. in a way in a world of, of, you know, like the Tinders and the, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the Bumble, Bumble ones yeah, or Bumble, whatever. Yeah, Bumble, Tinder, Raya, right, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, all these things that, um, which are inauthentic. <laughs> right. Really, and to, the bottom line is those are inauthentic. Yeah. And I know it works for some people and right. all that stuff, but, but, how, so you're just right there trying to navigate the dating world. It's got to be a little more yeah. difficult because yeah. I always say that in dating, people send their representatives and then... Once the people get comfortable, the representatives go home, and you're left with the real person. Exactly. You're like, Where did you come from? Yeah, exactly. Are you? So yeah. how how is it that you thought? I mean, I mean, again, you sound like an adventurer, so you right. just kind of jumped into it. Exactly. But uh, suddenly you're in this world of reality television, which isn't that ironic, of right. course, because we all—I mean, we all know at this point there's right. been article upon article about the scripting of yeah. reality television. Sure. So, what was your thought going into that when you? Yeah. You're, and then how do you deal with And I'm going to confess, you, I, I yeah. don't watch those shows. I, right. just, but I, I'm always curious. I'm one of my best friends in the whole world um, when I, she, she you know, lives with her, right. with her family. And I, when I go over to her house, they always have like, the reality shows on. And right. I watch them and they're <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. They really, they really are. are. They're fascinating. Absolutely. All of them, whether it's the dress one or the date right. one or, you know, it doesn't right. matter. I, even if it's flippy house one the, right. the watching people in that way yeah real people in an unrealistic with a environment yeah. camera on them mm -hmm. how in the world can anyone i suppose eventually you don't realize it's kind of like being naked with someone eventually right. you don't see that they're naked right, right? exactly they're just, they're just, just the there. person again yeah. um so how do you do that how does somebody living their authentic life go yeah. into a situation where everything is hyper surreal right well i think that you know that was part of and and the feedback after kind of proved that too was that you know i went into it i was in that phase of my life where i was transitioning i was saying why not to a lot of things the opportunity came up out of the blue and i said okay why not mm -hmm. so then i go into it and i you know being a sociology major from college and being having led led you know dozens and dozens of different types of soldiers and different backgrounds and feeling like i was self-aware and understood who i was as a person and understood people very quickly around me i was like this is a social experiment. I understand it's a social experiment. Now, there are things that I, behind the curtain that I still don't know because I hadn't gone through it yet. So I was like, I don't know. You know, people always, there's rumors, you know, the public loves the rumors about, like, is, how real can it be? Is it possible? Um, all these things that are in pop culture about those shows. I said, I want to go in there and find out for myself. Like, what, take it one day at a time and see what happens. What happens mentally, emotionally? Uh, logistically, how does all that happen? And I want to just be in the middle of it. And maybe it happens for me. Maybe I get wrapped up in it and it can happen because at the end of the day, those shows do, at least for appearances sake, and sometimes even, uh, you know, in reality, they they produce relationships and, and every once in a while, mm -hmm. healthy a healthy relationship. Sure. So I was like, there is all, there's so much going on here and so much to go find out and just explore. Right. So I went into it with just an open mind and say, what? What what can I learn here? And about are you myself? sequestered with these people? Yeah, you have no 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 internet, no phone contact to the wow. outside world. There's only emergency contacts. And how you know? long? And so it's an eight week filming process. Okay. So that's a long time, really, to be. Oh, absolutely. Wow. It's weird. You get you have your phone up, which most you know ninety nine percent of people today in in the states anyway. Like your phone is something that you're on. You mm -hmm. communicate through your phone on a daily basis more than any other communication form. Probably you know you sleep next to it, you wake up next to it. You go check your email when you wake up. You check your email before you go to bed. Sure. You text and social media and all that stuff. So you put that aside. So that was interesting. Um, and then you have just no contact. There's not even a TV, which 
this has been a 20th century entertainment. The main primary entertainment you know, outlet is a TV, so you can't just sit down and veg and watch TV. You have to interact with these people, and you've got the cameras around, and then also it's not only it's just reacting with random people like Big Brother, but it's like it's all all men all like trying to have a dating relationship with one woman. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, this is a crazy social experiment. Let's go just jump into it. So, yeah. um, so anyway, uh, I think that we got, I got a lot of feedback after the show that, th- you know, the fans of the show, they could see, which is even interesting. They can see nonverbal communication and, you know, along with the verbal communication, they, they saw me as authentic and genuine on the show because the conversations I was able to have, the, the communication I was able to have, with with um, the girl on the show is that it was it was real and authentic and people could see that and it translated to the TV screen. Was she good um, at being authentic? Whatever that means. Well, you know, I, I, you know I don't, I mean? I, you know, I don't know. I never, you know, we, we have the on screen relationship and then, like you said, people, you know, in dating, people they come, they bring their best, stick They're their best foot forward, yeah. you know, and then and then at six months later after you've been with them twenty four seven, you're like, oh, okay, I see the more real version of you yeah. uncovered. Um, so, you know, I, I never got below the surface with her because, you know, you have this on-screen relationship and you feel there's chemistry or whatever level that is. But then, you know, only the guy that ends up with her will know six months later what's the real That's motivations and the, sure. you know, the, the, the not so, um, you know, um, dramatic, pretty side of what was going on. Yeah. Know? So anyway, um, so yeah, so that was just... It was fun to go through that. It was fun to learn through that, try to be vulnerable and open to the process, open to the relationship and all those things. And I was. And um, and again, it was just another phase of me learning about myself, learning about more people and then and just communicating with the world and just being open and vulnerable. And so what did you I love it. I don't regret it at all. As far as that goes. Uh, yeah. Through that process. Yeah. I think that, I don't know, there was little things I learned, like seeing myself on screen, which I had never, you know, I had, you know, never had anything but a phone video, you know, that uh, taken with friends or something. So you, I had no clue what I looked like or how I, how I was having conversations, you know, or especially a romantic conversation, like in a relationship or like how, what I look like making out with somebody. I never, <laughs> never like kissed somebody on screen. Right. That's hilarious. So then I, that plays back and you're like, what in the, I'm like, oh like wow. God. I mean, I made out with people in prom, at prom. I made out like, I've never seen myself do it on screen. Like, this is weird, you know? That would so, be very weird. Yeah. Too. So there's just all these little things that were really <laughs> weird about it. Um, and then you just, you're like, oh, I didn't know I made that face. Or I didn't know I said like when I got nervous every every 15 seconds in a conversation. You know, or preface everything I said with like. Um, so you just see all these little intricacies about your you as a communicator that you do. Some things you're okay with. Some things you're like, ah, I need to, well, chill on that. Just stop that. Cut that bad habit out. And all these things. Um, and then you you also, it takes you to another level of being able to perceive a situation quickly, a social situation, and how to, like being around the producers who are controlling the show, being around those other those other peers of yours, and, and understand and perceive that quickly and, and kind of dissect what's going on around you and then how to um, still stay intact with who you are and not get wrapped up or chase, you know, go down a rabbit hole or rabbit trail that 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 show or the emotion of that show on the surface level may take you down can you can you com- maintain your composure and then or do you allow yourself to participate in those emotional conversations and the the hearsay that's happened the drama you know that happens on the show so um yeah that that all that all helped me to do that and it and it helped me to see you know i was having real conversations with uh uh her name is jojo the girl that was the lead, lead character of the show so i was having real conversations about because people ask me, is it real or fake? And I always tell them, like, halfway through the season, it becomes real. Because then you go introduce them to your family and your parents. like, And there will be one person that ends up going home with this person. And they are together. They're engaged at the end of this whole process in real life. No cameras around. So you, as a guy, you know, the top three or four guys, you start having to have that conversation, that transformation. And being like, wait a minute, okay. So I'm not just saying cool things and, like, romantic things anymore for the sake of cameras or whatever. Like... I have to know if this girl will work. Like, will we work for each other? Like, is this relationship going to work when the cameras turn off? 
And so <laughs> those last couple of weeks, you're like, you're really sweating it. You're trying to like think and, but then you don't have control over how much you can be with them or communicate. And like and that starts getting restricted by the producer of the show. And so that's when you really are like, ah, you, it takes a lot out of you. It took a lot out of me emotionally. I was like feeling anxiety and stuff. Cause I, I was trying to understand and try to get to know her, but then they'll, they'll purposely frustrate you and like keep you away from her. So you can't have the conversation that you want to have or whatever. And, uh, that, that's when it got really interesting. But again, I learned all that about myself. How do you do foster intimacy when there's cameras rolling on you? Like, how do you make your moves? <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's like what you touched on it earlier is that, you know, what's that show naked and unafraid or whatever that uh, one yeah. other reality show uh-huh. is. I guess like once it was just the shock factor at the beginning and then of people being naked or whatever. And then you just start to adjust to it yeah. becomes reality. So after those first few days of cameras being around and the, like the producers would tell you like these cameras, you have to picture them as just furniture. They're, they're not, they're not, they're not people to be interacted with although they are, but you don't interact with them. They're just furniture. You just focus on what you're doing in the moment in the relationship. So it's awkward at first. And then over time, over eight weeks and that's all you have every day, and you just get very comfortable with, hey, be like, look, this is between me and you, me and her, me and you. This is not between the cameras. They're just here. It's so. almost like watching um, a Greek play in a way. There's yeah. this mythology to this whole situation yeah. where you have the gods, which are the producers, right, that are exactly. manipulating oh, what's going on among the mortals. Right. And you have to succumb to whatever crazy yeah. thing's going on. And uh-huh. they, they even get to decide how you're perceived by the public. Right, absolutely. Which can be completely opposite. Right. They can't take a zero, you know. They can't take a zero skill and make it a ten and one and one attribute or another of somebody's personality, but they can definitely adjust it three mm-hmm. or four points on a scale of one to ten. You know? Which is fascinating, right? If somebody's kind of like maybe a abrasive personality, and maybe like a five or a six, like mm, they're they're kind of abrasive. They can make them a nine yeah. and make them like a villain and make them like look right. like the worst person in the world. You know what I mean? Just with a hint of abrasiveness. It, it so things like that. speaks to how easily manipulated we are right. as a whole. How which real. I think if you step outside of the culture of reality television and right. look at even politics. And I don't oh, abso- care if you're absolutely. left, right, in the middle, whatever. The, the circus that is politics. Yeah. It, they know how to manipulate we, the people that are in the show. Yeah, you know oh, what I mean? I, oh and, for sure. And I wish people could sort of make that... Hunger Games are not that far away. I know, right? <laughs> and they've really got us all yeah. on a fever pitch of fighting amongst each other and, right. and making families even... are having They don't go to Thanksgiving right. anymore because the exactly. politics is so out of control that... Yeah. The infighting is out of control, but what a great way to right. to be able to manipulate well, whatever you want outside of that. I mean, and back to the original question, that's one of the other things I learned about, um, you know, being on TV, being re- not just reality TV, but being on the outlet that we call TV. That is such a normal household, just um, fixture for Americans born in the 20th century. And TV is so powerful. I mean, there's 370 million people or whatever in America and a very high percentage of those people have access to a TV. It's a very normal thing to them to see anything that they see on there. They have this, um, you know, high propensity to believe what they see on there and it, the, the leverage and the power that comes through that. And so they can watch a reality TV show and now millions of people, 8 million, whatever, 10 million people watch that show in particular. Now no, take normal people that are the cast members on that show they watch the show for two months, so, you know, 10, 8, 10, 11 episodes of a person being on a TV show, and now they, that person has transitioned into a celebrity status person in, in the U.S., mm-hmm. and now airports coast to coast, Starbucks coast to coast, there's people that now everywhere in, US, in the U.S. will know and see these normal people before the show now as celebrities. And they're still just the same people they were six months before the show, but they're seen as celebrities. They've seen that they're like, you know, kind of on a pedestal at that point. And so some people, people have to deal with, how do you deal with that? Do you take it and run with it and, you know, and let it get to your head? Do you, do you maintain, you know, your self-awareness and stay who you are try to stay centered through that? Um, does that bother you? Some people don't like it. They want to be very private with their life, but then they'll end up on a TV show like that which is not a great idea if you do want to be private and then try to be private afterwards and then it's a struggle for them. They've set themselves up for a struggle. So um, that that whole just um, phenomenon itself is just interesting. And to see, you know, a guy like me where you know, whatever small circle I had before 
and then hit that celebrity kind of status of 10 million people knowing my name or well, more than that I mean 10 million people watch it every week so I now go coast to coast I'm like I'm still just in awe like wow I'm just landed in Phoenix for an hour and then I went up, ended up in Miami and then like how widespread people all of a sudden know your name they know your my parents we had one episode of my parents and my family were on the show and now millions of people like know my parents face and can recognize them and it's like so you turn that not just from reality tv but just the people that are, are t- characters on tv and the politics that come through tv and, and and the power that hollywood has um you know and the power that the news outlets cnn and fox news and all those they battle for you know every every week about the you know the conservative versus the liberal sides and all these all these things are happening all in this outlet that we call tv and people are just watching it they're watching it at the airport they're watching it on their phone they're watching it at their house their kids are watching it their grandma's watching it everybody's watching and trying to, and just they're just taking this all in and just processing it and making opinions about life and about the future of their family the future the the state of the um, union, the state of the world, they understand it through what they see on a television screen. And so being a part of that helped me understand how powerful that is. It's mm-hmm. super powerful. So. Yeah. I read an article way back when, do you know Mark Harmon is, the actor? He's on um, that show, NCIS. Okay, yeah. yeah okay, so absolutely. Mark Harmon, years and years ago, played Ted Bundy okay, on a yeah. TV movie. And I read an article where he was saying that uh, it was really difficult after that movie mm-hmm. came out because the perception... To rebrand himself, yeah. Even people who knew him well yeah. had a different... They, yeah. they behaved differently That's around scary. him because he played that character of Ted Bundy so right. exceptionally well right. that it, it... They didn't want to trust it, him. Yeah. yeah. And that, is, that speaks a lot to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. The, the manipulation that the capable... Our brains are just like little silly putty things. Oh, absolutely. Whatever they're sticking on, you know, they, they absorb. Yeah. So how do you... <laughs> So here's a guy looking for love in all the wrong places, whatever, <laughs> looking for love. And then you go yeah. on this show and you think, hey, I'll give it a shot. It's a social experiment, sure. which would be, I think, how I would feel about it. Yeah. It would be a fascinating experience. Right. And then you go on and it, do what you will. And you made it to the very end, correct? Uh, no, I, I was the fourth to go out. Fourth to go out? Yeah. Okay. So, um, sorry. But it made it to like the last, yeah, okay. the last two episodes. Okay. So, and then you, you come off the show. Yeah. And now you're in the quote unquote real world, whatever right. that means. Sure. Because you know, it's not that real yeah. anymore, <laughs> right. unfortunately. But um, how do you. And now you're, as you said, you're, you, you have a moniker of celebrity. Now right. add that other hat. Right. Right? So now how are you supposed to come to a dating situation yeah. and weed out those people that aren't yeah. just going, oh, Luke the celebrity or Luke right, the. Right. Bachelor dude that was on the Bachelorette, yeah. or you know, or whatever it is. Right. It's yeah. a whole. It's it's almost like you set yourself up for another disaster. In oh, that absolutely. Way. Um, yeah, that that's still to be determined. Um, you know, the outcome of that, or and the implications of of that whole situation that you just outlined. Um, you know, it's been um, a year since I started filming that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was started last March, so. Um, it's been since the show ended it was August, so now it's been like eight months since it ended. Uh, it's yeah, it's completely interesting. You know, I, I've I've seen some repercussions of that uh, in in dating. You know, whereas like there was some there was actually some you know I don't I don't know, I'll, I'll address it here for a little bit. It won't be a lot, but um, there was a YouTube video made of of girls that I had dated, two girls I had dated separately, like met each other, and then like decided that they didn't like how whatever I handled the relationship with them or whatever they talked about it they made it decided to make a YouTube video because one of them was a video a YouTube like blogger or whatever so they make a video about like um, you know to I guess warn other women that might be dating me of how you know I whatever I did wrong to them mm-hmm. they didn't want me to do that wrong again so I was like okay uh, one of the girls I, I did, I dated for like three months and we had a very mutually respectful relationship. We met families and it was like, you know, a thing that we thought there would be a future there and all that. Didn't work out, you know, dating relationships don't always work out. But, um, so then she decided to go back and, and meet with this other girl and make, and go through this whole process and, so make, wait, and she, make it a public thing. She met with her and t- the other, let's just call I don't, them I don't Jane know, and I don't, Joe. Yeah, I don't know I don't if know they met, uh, I think they probably met coincidentally oh, just okay. in, in town or and something. And then they started talking. And then they started talking and then they realized they both, you know, had dated me at, 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 at certain points. And, 
and decided to like make this this thing and I was like seems like a weird it, way to it was spend very your time. it was very derogatory uh, about you know and then not negative I mean not positive at all it's negative about you know my uh, reputation and some things like that and kind of you know throwing me under the bus in a lot of ways and I was like wow these are not like I wasn't there was, there was no divorces here these are just normal dating relationships I dated one girl you know uh, last summer for like literally like three dates the other one was like uh, three months like I said and then they just made they made it escalated it into the dr- drama of like the whole TV world and knew that all these TV fans that um, you know watch my and watch my my dating status and watched it on TV watched it off screen they knew that that would elevate and be like a viral thing and so um, they decided to make it and what's funny is like the one girl that I did date like she had um, you know she's warning girls about me which I didn't do really do anything except break up with her so if I was nobody, if like there wasn't a celebrity status around my dating status, um, nobody cares about the YouTube video. Like it's just like another guy that you broke up with. You don't sit down and make a YouTube video about that. You know, I mean, it's just like I think this speaks to her character. More well, than I mean that and, and that's, lack thereof. Me. That that's what that's what it showed, and I was like, wow, that's that's sad that you know they they that's their prerogative. They decided to make that a public thing and like choose to kind of go on the offensive and attack like that. And I was like. Wow! Like, but don't you feel why? the bottom line has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them wanting to get that I, celebrity I do. for themselves? I do, but again, from the position of which they brought it and the angle which they brought it to the public, then there's this whole, all these public yeah. um, viewers then see me, they're like, oh, well, they said it, so it must be true. He right. must really? be he must be a bad guy. And then tabloids get fired up. And sure. there's this whole back and forth of, of uh, you know, Bachelor podcasts and Bachelor uh, uh, articles written about this and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, like... These are just people that were normal relationships. I've been dating people for 10 years or whatever. You, you Sometimes you go three dates. Sometimes you go three months. You break up. You do the best you can. Sure. You know, say say what has to be said. You move on to the next one. Right. And, and uh, you know, trying to find that person that you should be with forever. And that's what those were. And then they, you know, glorified it and made it into, like, a whole public YouTube video right. and this whole thing. I was like, wow, that's just disrespectful in a lot of ways. And so that's been one of those repercussions. It's like I have no control over that. But it happens mm-hmm. because of the bachelor thing that is that that whole side of the world that views me as that guy. They want to know like how is he in relationships, you know? And so it's interesting, like not being an actor on like a scripted TV show or like a, a pro sports athlete or something like that, where you know people aren't as concerned. They're maybe concerned if you get married or have kids or whatever. They'll like that's a tabloid worthy or newsworthy story, quote unquote. But when you're in the reality dating world, then you come back to that and you just want to date and kind of take that back to the private side of life. Mm -hmm. You can't because the whole world's watching, like everybody you take a picture with, you might be dating them. Or if it's another celebrity that, you know, has that status, you might be dating them. And so it's, it's very, um, judgmental about who you're dating and how you are in relationships and all from the outside looking in. So that's kind of been a negative that I've felt in the last few months about that whole situation. So, do you anyway. read that stuff? I mean, when you do, you get a Google alert that says, "Hey, well, someone else is talking about you," or do you try to shut? That well, off? you know, social media kind of connects all that back mm-hmm. together, so you'll get like tagged or whatever on social uh, media, yeah. and then your social media starts having these these flare ups of of interaction mm-hmm. from the public, and you're like, "What is that flare up about?" And that's what you know, you find mm-hmm. out what triggered it or whatever, or the tabloids start calling your phone and saying, "Hey, these people are saying this about you. These girls made a YouTube video. We'd like to get your reaction." Please, you, you want to tell the world that you're not, you know, you're not a bad guy and that you're not going to, like, you know, not ever call these girls again or what, like, all these things. It's like, wow. They see the opportunity that all these people that watch that television show that I was on want to know about my dating relationship. So if somebody addresses that publicly, then people will watch it. And mm-hmm. so that's why they chose to do it, it's like, I'm assuming. So um, anyway, that was, that was interesting to go through that. But yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I I pick it pick up pick it up and take it for what it is and move on and say, okay, well, I'll just continue trudging on, being authentic and genuine, being the best version of myself that I can be, and right. you know, hope hope the best for them. And, and well, if it makes you feel better, not being on a television show and trying to date in a world that is pretty inauthentic when you're authentic is also is also hard, tough. So, yeah. yeah, so even more so when you <laughs> open yourself up to the whole yeah, world. Scene, yeah, the so. celebrity thing uh, just adds another interesting element to yeah. it for sure. Absolutely. Um, so let's circle back around to the creative yeah. world. Um, 
Do you have? Are you working on a record right now? What are you doing? Yeah, um, we're, we're we've released a couple of tracks uh, from the beginning of this year and uh, January and then uh, March. And are then they on iTunes? They're on they're on iTunes okay. and and Spotify and all those outlets. And and then um, we're we're working right now, writing in, in in the studio to release what we'll call uh, an EP. So um, we're looking to hopefully release two EPs this year. Uh, may just be one um, as far as the timeline goes, but um, so this summer we'll be able to release the remaining piece of the EP that we started, uh, and that the, that's the two of the first six songs, and so um, are out now. So in it, and then um, oh okay, so you've done the two. We've done two, and we'll we'll do like right. four more, and yeah, then yeah. kind of repackage it and have six total out uh-huh. for the first EP, and then that's exciting. Yeah, it is re- that your first record? It is. It's it's oh. my first official um, Nashville recorded EP. So okay. um, that that's that's exciting. It's fun. It's just kind of you know, me finally taking, you know, what we've talked about this whole time of being vulnerable and, 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 and leaving that other transitioning from that other life that I had in the military and the corporate world and all those lessons that I learned and I try to bring them back over here and then be vulnerable and let the world see them in the, in the confines of a song, you know, in, in the form of a song. Did and you write so, all those songs? Um, yeah, the two that we released, yeah, I wrote those with a couple of buddies of mine. One, the, the first one was a guy uh, named Michael White. Um, that's a great songwriter. He was an artist in the 90s and a great friend of mine. I uh, wrote that with him. The other one I wrote with uh, um, Jaron Boyer and Brandon Kinney, both great friends of mine that mm-hmm. write here at Peer Publishing. So, um, yeah, so it's just interesting. I, lo- I love what I do. I love being able to do that, have have that come to fruition where you know we can put life experiences in a song and 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 send it out to the world and hopefully hopefully it you know has a positive impact on somebody and hopefully people can connect with it and in, in, in one way or another and it can be something that either brings a smile to their face or you know a, a, a little chuckle or just some type of emotion that it evokes out of other listeners and that's what i love about that creative process of writing songs and being an artist is that you can you can produce and create a record and create music that people connect with mm-hmm. and it's timeless. You know, if, if it's a great song, that song lives on forever and it changes lives. People, they'll play it at their wedding, they'll play it at a funeral, they'll play it at a birthday party, they'll mm-hmm. play it when they're driving down the road and it, and it connects and changes and impacts their life in some way. And so that's always the, the constant pursuit of a songwriter and a creator is to have that. And then being an artist, going out on the road, you know, playing shows in all these venues is something that I love to do in this phase of my life now is that I go, I can go to Birmingham, Alabama, Lexington, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, Indianapolis, and just I can go coast to coast in all these towns now. And people, you know, some people know the music, some people know me from the TV show, and they come there and they all, you know, connect in that one place. And I'm able to, you know, share that emotion, share that moment with them, have a have a great time and and then and go to the next town and meet more people meet see another venue learn something else about the world and uh it's just it's been great to just be and 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 feel all that kind of come full circle for me and i'm right in the middle of it right now and 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 i love i love every day i love getting up and i don't i've worked harder i work harder right now than i've ever worked in my life i work 24 7 but you know i do what i love and i don't feel like I ever work a day in my life, you know? And That's I love the it. goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely the goal. So that was the main reason to come back to Nashville and, and to come back and find this spot that I'm in now is that I didn't want, you know, I wanted to find that happy place that I didn't work a day in my life. And yeah. I finally, I, I feel, I know what that feels like now. And so it's, uh, it's good. I'm happy. Do so. you have five, ten year that's like the worst question ever, but you know, yeah. the sort of things that Five or ten year plan? Yeah, did you ever? Yeah, no, absolutely. Five, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big goal guy. You know, I, I learned that from the military. I learned it from, you know, my dad before that. Just, you know, set goals and, you know, go chase those goals um, and find your path to get to them. And it, sometimes they change over time and they will because life happens and yeah. you just continue to, you know, assess and make new goals. And and uh, so, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like, I, I, I'm, I love Nashville. I want to stay here. I want to keep digging into this. Uh, this world of being a creator and being a songwriter and an artist that I'm in now, uh, just really get you know sink my teeth into this community and just plant some roots here and um, yeah I just I love that so yeah and also what I'm doing it, it's it's a long process to go it, it never really ends it's you know I talk to other artists that you know are ten years ahead of me or twenty years ahead of me uh, in terms of in terms of time and career progression and be like you know it's always 
there's never like an end state to it. It's just like you just you just keep progressing, you know, and you keep learning, growing, reaching into new new uh, you know areas of your life, new areas of the world, and and uh, just keep creating. And I, I think that that's one of the reasons I love creating is because it never ends. It's mm-hmm. just a lifelong pursuit of mm-hmm. creating and, and impacting the world in whatever way that you know that you can. So yeah. and whatever tools that you've been given to to do that, um, you can change the world and leave a legacy. And for one person or for a million people, whatever that is. And you want so, that I to think, be your your creat- your words, your music, you think? Yeah, I, I think I think, you know, my music is one place that I can one platform that I can leave that legacy and leave uh, a story behind for you know, other people to learn from. But then also just what I do as an artist going out and playing live shows and meeting people face to face and hugging people and shaking hands and building new relationships and friendships. Um, is also the other way to do that. You know, those you're making memories with those people, and you're, um, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, there's people that like, they just volunteered to run fan clubs for me that came from mm-hmm. the TV show, and uh, there's ones that um, there's a company that I work with called the Giving Key, um, which they'll have, they have these keys that are uh, on necklaces that they have a word on them of usually some type of inspiration. Is that uh, what you're say, wearing? It, yeah, that's yeah. I'm actually wearing one, and so. Um, I gave one away to a lady who she volunteers, you know, she's a, a mother of three, a wife, lives in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, she, she volunteers to um, help with my fan club and help kind of spread the word and what we do mm-hmm. uh, in the music. And then also she does so many more things than that. She started the Veterans Charity, which I'm also very passionate about. Um, which she, one? Uh, mine, mine's called Creative Vets that I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's based out of Nashville. Um, hers is to help a vet or something. I can't remember exactly the nomenclature for it. Um, but her name's, uh, Trish and, and, and she also promotes that on, on my fan club sites and on my social media. But, um, yeah, she's just a person that just gives back and just loves people and just very salt of the earth. And, and so I gave her a believe key and we did it for the company and trying to promote, uh, the giving keys purpose and what they do. And it was, she was the perfect person to give it to. We did it at one of my shows and brought her on stage. And so, it's just those type of things that I'm like, you know, I wouldn't be afforded the opportunity to do that without having gone through what I went through this last year with the TV show and without being in music and put it, you know, coming back to Nashville and putting myself, uh, you know, in this in this life and in this 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 season of my life. And so I'm doing all that and those kind of moments. I'm like, you know, however I can connect with a woman like her and her family and if I can be an inspiration for her kids she's got you know sons that you know she's told me oh they look up to you and whatever and you know it's just those type of moments are inspiration for me to keep pushing forward and keep being the best version of myself and you know trying to be a good example for younger generations coming up and trying to impact people's lives however I can and just bring support and bring just positive energy and bring you know just something of worth to other people because that's why i wake up every day that kind of thing is why those things like that youtube video don't matter yeah because at the end of the day yeah what those what anybody says about you is of no and not just you the royal you yeah is of no consequence because if you know who you are and your place in the world none of that stuff matters and it will eventually fall away and if whom it matters to that's going to be their own journey. Exactly. And it has nothing to do with you, really. Mm-hmm. So I love that. That's know, awesome. That's I love thing. that. I do. Speak about your charity for me. I didn't know you had a charity. Uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't start the charity. Uh, I feel like uh, you know God brought me to meeting a guy, a good friend of mine now. His, his name's Richard Casper. Uh, we actually met before I went on The Bachelorette. And uh, he uh, was is a veteran himself, former Marine. Um, he had some traumatic brain injuries and had um, some issues uh, from PTSD and some things to deal with that were, uh, you know, physical issues and, and, and some things and memory loss and some things like that. And so he went through his own, his own journey, figuring out how to deal with that and how to, um, you know, tell his story. And then found, came to a point where he wanted to help other people be able to tell their story and deal with those same, you know, issues he was dealing with. He met a couple of uh, other people that were the end up being the co-founders of this organization called Creative Vets. And Creative Vets, um, they, they work in the art space to help veterans um, and give them long-term solutions um, and another outlet to tell their story and deal with 
you know, what, whatever happened to them, if it was an injury, if it was PTSD or whatever, um, they bring them to Nashville, they get them with A-list songwriters and they help them write a song based off of their experience in the military or really whatever is just on their heart that they want to write a song about. They help them and give them the guidelines to help write that song and, and give it life. Um, they also have a partnership with the Chicago Art Institute. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and they wow. and they have this program. It's like a six-week program where they bring veterans in and they can go through this program uh, at the Art Institute to be able to express themselves and tell their story through art. Mm-hmm. And uh, Beautiful. So, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a great organization, great people, which is the most important part of me is that I, I know and have faith in who they are as mm-hmm. people and that their intentions are great. And uh and so anyway, so I, I, I jumped on board and just wanted to make that my primary charity that, that I give back to and spend my time promoting. Because, you know, being a veteran myself, being a songwriter, it just worked out perfectly. Sure, so, makes total yeah. sense. Luke, you're great. Thank yeah. you so much Thanks for, for today. being it was awesome. on the show. Enjoyed okay. it. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait, before we, yeah. before we sign off. Luke Powell. Yes. Say your full name. Luke Powell. Yes. Where can people find you? Uh, yeah, so um, my website is simply that my website's lukepell.com and then i'm on social media as well twitter facebook uh just under luke Pell snap, or? snapchat um there there's variations of it you can search luke Pell on all those platforms and you're probably uh, pretty easy and, to find, and find at this me point. on those platforms yeah. <laughs> so, all right thank you so for much. being on this show i really appreciate it, it all awesome. right, bye everybody